It's about time that we look into my seven ceramic hand building techniques that you need to know and use. It should come as no surprise that the number one technique on the list is score and slip. You must be scoring and slipping to put clay together. When something is built out of one piece of clay like this pinch pot, it's strongest. But when you have to put pieces of clay together, you must score and slip to make sure that they become one piece of clay again. And to do this, you need to first rough up or score the parts that you're going to put together, all of them, and you must use really gooey, gross, and slimy slip. When I say gross, it just means that it has a consistency of mud. If you don't have that muddy consistency, it's not as good as you think it's going to be in bonding things together. Now sometimes when you have a lot of surface area, one touching another, like coils on top of each other, you might be able to blend new clay together. Older clay, you're going to have to score and slip either way. That blending is not as strong as scoring and slipping, but if you can make it through the firing process, both bisque and glaze, then everything should hold together if you can get that to work. The only surefire way to make sure that any two pieces stay together is to score well and slip well. And by scoring, you need to take a tool of some type and gouge into the surface. And that gouging gives you more surface area for the slip to grab onto. Then you need to put the slip into the score marks. Now the score marks should be on both pieces that you're putting together, and the slip should be on both pieces that you put together. And then the slip should squirt out the sides, showing that the air bubbles have all been pushed out. Then you can clean it up afterwards using fingers or tools. If you find that you're having difficulty keeping things together, hold them together while they're scored and slipped for about 30 seconds to a minute and I think that you will find that the bond increases over time. Failure to properly score and slip things together account for most times when things fall apart. Here's an example of a piece of foil pottery that was slipped but not scored. Here's a piece that was properly scored and slipped together. Both the small slab decorations and handle stayed on this mug because they were properly scored and slipped. The next technique on the list is pressing your tools and pressing clay rather than dragging things through it. Quite often, we try to use our tools like pencils, and this raises a burr along the edge that needs to be cleaned up afterwards, and that cleanup process can take longer than actually making the initial marks. So when you're making lines in the surface, or you're trying to put a texture into something, press it into your clay rather than dragging across the surface, because that dragging builds up clay along the edge and makes a mess. To press things into your clay, you can, one, make sure they're wet, two, use an extreme lower angle, which will help, especially when the tool is wet, or just push into the clay. Pushing into the clay doesn't raise that burr along the edge, and there's less cleanup afterwards. Sometimes we can also press expendable materials into our clay, things that will burn out in the kiln, like these pasta letters which will go up in flames inside the kiln safely and leave voids behind giving a texture of the words. Materials like paper and cloth will burn out the same way. There are also non-expendable materials like these letters that can be pressed into the surface and not left in the clay that will do similar things. Here's what pasta letters look like once they've burned out, and some of this is stamped material as well. Using a cookie cutter to stamp Luther's seal into this medallion, and then plastic letters for the back. Three is the creation and stealing of textures. Clay is very malleable, and you can press textures in from all sorts of sources. Items like coarse cloth can leave fabric textures. 
things like plastic texture sheets that are made for drawing and sometimes for ceramics can be used to put interesting textures in. Tools can be used to press textures in. Objects like seashells, sponges, you name it. If it has an interesting texture on it, you may be able to use it to press that texture into clay. You need to keep in mind that any texture that you steal in this manner is the reverse of the texture that you're actually stealing it from. So when I press a seashell in, I get the reverse of that texture, which may or may not look exactly like the seashell that I want it to be. It may just make indentations in an interesting pattern. And that's okay. It might make a texture entirely different than what you expected, but experiment. Take a piece of clay, press it on an object, Take a tool, press it in, use different patterns, putting things side by side and repeating the same shape over and over again in different ways can give you different textures. Some of them are very specific, some of them very general, but just chewing up the surface like you're scoring and slipping doesn't necessarily make a good texture, it just makes things rough. By using a tool over and over again, using different textures that you press things into, then you will find you have quite a repertoire that you build up over time. Eventually you may build or find forms that you wish to repeat over and over again. In this case you may make a mold of that shape. It's a possibility. This one is made with plaster and it repeats the shape of this fish over and over again. And by pressing it down on a surface that it sticks to I can pull it out of the mold. Plaster does that nicely plastic not so much with clay. By using different surfaces, tools, and patterns you will come up with a repertoire of different types of textures that you can use throughout your work. You will be surprised using one tool may create multiple textures you didn't even realize that you had at your disposal. When working with textured surfaces, you might want to keep in mind what sorts of glazes you're using. Some glazes will smooth things out, and others will show the indentations and patterns in the textures more fully. It's up for you to figure that out and decide. Number four is to be able to throw a slab or roll one and turn a shape into a form, building with those slabs. To throw a slab, you literally just throw it, not hard new clay will flatten out nicely when you throw it against the surface. And this is just a gentle, almost gravity with just a little bit of force behind it. You can pat it with your hands, you can roll it with a roller, and you can throw it down and flatten out a side. Depending on the table, this technique can make quite a bit of noise, so use it judiciously and quickly. Now I'm going to use a simple slab to turn a shape into a form. Shape is flat two-dimensional and form is three-dimensional. You can travel around it as a front, back, sides. This slab has some thickness to it and I'm going to mark it here in a circle and then I cut out the circle and smooth out the edges and I have a disc which might be considered a short cylinder. Um, you can make a taller one up to about an inch or so this way and still be able to use it in your sculpture. And this is a very simple way of building up layers in your work. So here I have a disc and I can use other different types of forms to mark things, even a compass to make circles. I can make other shapes as well. First I'll throw a slab that's a little thicker than the old one and then I'll mark out a star here using a popsicle stick to make straight lines. When I cut this out, I can use the other side if I don't want the lines that I drew initially to show. Then I'm going to hollow out the underside of it a bit so that it's not quite as thick in the middle especially. And eventually I'll steal some textures from an old sponge and I'll make it into a starfish. Often by starting with simple slabs and then turning shapes into forms, you can build things up to make more and more dynamic sculptures. 
By using different forms, you can create the illusion of different objects. And layering slabs can create a feeling of depth in a piece that's otherwise going to be very flat. Next, I'm going to roll out a more regular slab. First, I'm going to flatten the sides by throwing it a couple times. And then I'm going to pat it out. And I'm going to use limiting sticks. Now, these are yard sticks, and they're each one eighth of an inch thick. So if I use one on top of another, I get a quarter inch. So there's two on one side, two on the other. And by rolling across these, I make sure that it only goes a quarter of an inch thick. And I also know that the direction I roll my slab in, it will get longer. So if I wanted to get longer one way or another, I just turn the slab one side to the other. I can mark things out with a ruler like this, and I can cut a line down them, or I can use the ruler itself as a straight edge. Either way, if I cut the sides off and get things nice and straight, I have building materials, like lumber, but made out of clay. Now I could carefully measure out pieces using a ruler, or I can just cut a couple of pieces and use the pieces to measure the pieces by placing one piece on top of another. And as long as I have my slabs all about the same thickness, I just need to allow for that quarter inch of thickness between them. Now once I've cut out enough pieces to sort of show you here, I'm going to make corners and I'm going to make a part of a box, like a corner of a box, so you can see how things are put together using slabs. This will give you nice flat sides and it may take a few moments to actually put things together and the more pieces you have the stronger it becomes as more pieces hold each other together. You must never forget to score and slip along each of the edges that are going to touch each other. If you do not score and slip properly, which is technique number one, then it will fall apart. Slabs can be used to build all sorts of different shapes and objects and through the judicious use of different textures and glazes, you can create the illusion that a piece of ceramic that is all made from the same clay is actually made from different materials. The next thing you need to be able to do is pinch forms. That's not just pinch pots, but it, that's a big part of it. You need to be able to pinch things from one piece of clay, and that's when it's strongest. You can't use solid pieces of clay that are very thick. Usually the limit is about an inch thick. But you can make large forms that are hollow. And you need to be able to do that on a regular basis and pretty much on demand. The fact is that you can pinch a slab and you can pinch a coil. So using these techniques, one is not exclusive from the other. Here I've thrown a slab and I'm going to make it into sort of a hollow coil by rounding it out. By pinching your forms hollow, you can make them larger on the outside and lighter all around. It's a win-win situation. Here I'm taking a slab and I'm rounding it around and I'm going to score and slip the edge and make a larger pinched out coil from that slab. So just by using fingers and a couple of tools manipulating the clay, you can make all sorts of different forms like cylinders and tubes that you can use in larger constructions. The key is that you can make any shape relatively large as long as you make it hollow. Here we've made a slab coil that's a tube. You could put a base under it and make it into a cup. Either way, it's larger than an actual coil that you could have survive the kiln in a regular sculpture. Because it is hollow, it will weigh less than a solid structure, and it should dry more evenly throughout. You also have fewer chances of air bubbles because the clay itself is less massive. Now I'm going to take two pieces of clay of approximately equal size and make two pinch pots that are just about the same size and put them together to form a hollow shell. We do this sort of activity so that we have something to build on the outside or carve that is hollow inside so that it will dry more evenly. Keep in mind that there is an air pocket if you make something like this and you need to have some way for the air to escape. Even a small hole through the outside of the structure 
will allow the air to escape and then it won't explode. You can see that I'm going around and round and smoothing out the outside seam. I will even take a scoring tool and score over the outside to make the clay more malleable in those areas to get rid of that seam and eventually I get a hollow ball. Now in some way I need to make a hole for air to escape. Now this could be part of the sculpture like a slot for a piggy bank or it could be a larger opening or it could be secret so that it looks like a solid piece of clay made into a ball. However you choose to let the air flow through will affect the way people perceive your sculpture. Can light get through it? Is it an opening that something can be poured into or poured out of? Or is it hidden so that no one knows that it's in fact hollow? Our next important technique is using coils to build from the bottom up. Because clay has very good compression strength, meaning it will hold quite a bit of weight, but it has very poor tensile strength, meaning it will not support weight over an unsupported area, and it will not bend without breaking. Whether we use coils, slabs, or a pinch method, we want to start with a very strong base. Coils are just good for this process because they allow us to add just a piece at a time over an area. Now you can blend them together as well to make it smooth. Here I'm just making this a coil shape and accentuating the coil shape so that you can see that I've made a base and I'm going to start building up the sides on this. For this type of structure gravity becomes very important because it holds it all down and in place as I'm putting things together. You also must score and slip everything together. Now quite often with building with coils we might just blend the sides and hope for the best if it's new clay. If it's not new clay, you still need to score and slip. And if it is new clay, scoring and slipping won't hurt it. It will just strengthen the bond that you wish to have between the pieces of clay. You can see from this video that I am both scoring and slipping and blending pieces in the little cracks and holes so that it becomes watertight eventually. By doing this layer after layer, I can build a structure that I couldn't actually get my hand to the bottom of because there might not be a large enough opening at the top or all the way down for me to actually get my hand inside. But by building with something like coils from the bottom up, I can make that structure one layer at a time. By the time I reach my third layer of coils here, I think you get the idea building up maybe slightly out, maybe slightly in. These objects then have all been built using the coil method. Some have left the coil showing, some have been smoothed. Either way, they start from the bottom and they work their way up with gravity supporting them all the way through the process. Our seventh and final technique to highlight here is the use of molds to support your work or actually any structure that helps hold your work up while it's too weak to support itself. Because the clay slumps into this, we call this type of mold a slump mold. So as you can see here, I've created a coil bowl that probably couldn't hold itself up because it bows out on the sides. I put it in a plastic bowl and I used a liner to make sure that it didn't stick to the plastic bowl. And now that it's near leather hard, I can pull it out and clean up all the little bits and pieces on the outside that I couldn't see before. By building it in the bowl structure, I allow it to dry enough to hold itself together. Otherwise, the angles on the corners and the edges would probably make it cave outward and go flat when it was new clay. All sorts of simple structures can be used as molds. In this case, I'm going to use this bowl as a hump mold because the clay humps over it. And in this case, I'm going to use a slab. The moist clay of the slab wouldn't normally be strong enough to hold this structure. Now notice I put a liner underneath here of paper so that I can pull the slab off of the mold when it becomes just dry enough to hold its own weight. If I wait too long on a structure like this when it humps over the top, since the clay will shrink and the mold will not, it will have a tendency to break. To help keep it from breaking, I use the liner so that I can pull it off more easily and not allow the clay to actually stick to the mold. Clay likes to stick to non-porous plastic. 
you might also notice that I'm using a texture stick to give it some interest on the outside. I can do this while it's on top of the mold. If I press too hard, I might get rid of the texture on the inside. So I want to make sure that I don't bear down too hard. But as long as the clay is plastic and malleable, I can make all sorts of textures while it's still wet. All sorts of objects can be used as hump or slump molds. In this case, I'm going to use a wadded up piece of newspaper as a hump mold for this textured slab. By using other objects, including other pieces of clay that might dry out with the clay that you're making, you can create all sorts of different molds and structure supports that can be pulled away from an item before it goes in the kiln. Once an item is bisque fired, it becomes much stronger and easier to work with. So let's quick review. First we're going to score and slip to hold it all together. Then we're going to press our tools, not drag them like a pencil across the surface. We're going to create and steal many different types of textures. We're going to throw or roll slabs to use them to create form out of shapes. We're going to pinch forms and create hollow spaces. We're going to use coils to build from the bottom up. And finally, use molds to support your work. By using these techniques for hand building, you will find that many of the problems that you often encounter can be circumvented or your work can be made easier either way.